Dorothy's house and the International Pancake Race. I can see you're totally underwhelmed. All right, let, let's try this. How many of you like to eat beef? All right, if your hand's not up, we'll give an invitation at the end and you get saved. All right. How many of you have ever worn Nike shoes? Chances are uh, very good that the beef that you ate came from liberal Kansas. Chances are even better that shoes came from liberal Kansas. <laughs> I guess that's confirmation. <laughs> it's like, okay, door number two. <laughs> liberal is home to National Beef Packing, which is the nation's fourth largest uh, beef packing plant. Uh, they process 6,000 head of cattle a day. And um, they say that the leather on one out of every two pair of Nike shoes uh, comes from our plant. So there. <laughs> Anybody been to Liberal? Wow, all right, not bad. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there, right? <laughs> Um, we are way, we are way out in about five and a half hours from here, about three hours, hours just absolutely dead straight west of uh, Wichita. And uh, we are the last uh, town on Highway 54 before you uh, get into Oklahoma. I was telling the men last night I was actually born uh, in Liberal because it was the closest hospital. Um, but I was raised just across the state line uh, in the uh, panhandle of Oklahoma in a little town called Tyrone, about the size of Meredith. And uh, so uh, this is not un uncommon to me. And uh, I am, I'm excited about to being here, looking forward uh, to what the Lord has for us this week. I uh, was actually saved. Uh, at Fellowship Baptist Church as a bus kid and uh, then got, uh, got ministry staff there in 1981 and served in various uh, years. Uh, then in May of 2000, assumed the lead pastor's position there and had the privilege of pastoring the church that I was saved in as a bus kid. Uh, for another 20 years, so all told, I've uh, spent 39 years um, in full-time ministry in one uh, and that's Fellowship Baptist Church in Liberal, Kansas. And then in August of uh, 2020, I had the incredible opportunity to pass the torch to our son, uh, Tyler, who is now pastoring the church. Uh, he had served on staff with us for about 14 years prior to that, and um, just uh, through God's leading, um, we were able to do that. My official title now is Staff Evangelist. Uh, translated, old man put out to pasture is basically, <laughs> is basically what that means. Uh, but they're awful good to me, and, and God's, God has just been incredibly good to us. My wife, Katie, um, wasn't able to be with me. Uh, this weekend, but uh, we uh, got married in 1981 as well, and uh, she has served faithfully with me uh, all of these years, and uh, she is just an incredible lady, uh, just an, an, an amazing walk with God, and, and I've told people this before, if there's anybody on the face of the earth that I want praying for me, it would be my wife. Uh, my kids, uh, I mean, it's not uncommon for them to call and say, Mom, would you pray? They know that their mom is a praying woman. And I'm just thankful to be able to, uh, to have her uh, in my life as my wife and uh, the mother of our children. And uh, let me, let me do this real quick. I'm a terrible salesman, so forgive me if I don't do this real well. Um, but in February of 2018, uh, my wife and I received a phone call that no parent 
uh, ever wants to receive, and it was from our daughter-in-law uh, telling us that our oldest son uh, was dead. Um, TJ was 35 years old, uh, married three three beautiful daughters, and and uh, his life was taken in just a really freak accident while he was working on his pickup in their driveway. Lived in the Winfield area, actually in a little town called Burden, about 15 miles north and, and east of, of Winfield. And um, as I said, that was in 2018. As you can imagine, uh, that changed our lives forever. Uh, our lives have never been the same. Uh, they never will be the same. Thanksgiving will never be the same. Christmas will never be the same. Mother's Day will never be the same. Father's Day will never be the same. Uh, our life is, has forever changed. And that was a very difficult time uh, for us. And we're thankful for God's grace and God's ability uh, to, to see us through all of that. And um, a couple of years after that, God began to develop a message uh, in my heart that I titled, How to Get Through What You'll Never Get Over. And uh, as I began to uh, preach that message in, in various churches, I was asked to address the subject of grief at the uh, leadership conference in Lancaster, uh, California a couple of years ago. And Dr. Chapel approached me after that and said, Brother Prater, we've, we've got to get that in print. And so the result of that is, is this little 77-page booklet, How to Get Through What You'll Never Get Over, Walking Through Grief by the Grace of God. And um, we're thankful that the Lord has used um, this little booklet and, and that preaching literally all over the nation. Um, and next Sunday, I'll be in, in Fort Worth. My wife and I, we, we were just in uh, Durham, North Carolina last weekend, and uh, we'll be in Fort Worth next weekend uh, conducting what, what we have called uh, Walking Through Grief Sundays. And, uh, have, you know, so often when we encounter someone who's walking through grief, we just don't know what to say. You ever been there? And in that awkward moment when we just don't know what to say, so often, and, and it's not intentional, but so often people say some of the most awkward things like, well, God needed another angel or, well, God needed another flower in their garden or, well, God needed them more than you did. And just, I could go on and on and on with the silly, empty, nonsensical things that, that, that people say just because they don't know what to say. We have found that this, this little booklet has really helped with that. And uh, it just some, some principles of walking through grief at our son's funeral. A lady by the name of Sally got saved. And her salvation story is at the end of this book, so it's, a, it's also a, an evangelistic tool. But it's really easy to hand somebody this book and, and say this, listen, I don't know what you're going through. I've never gone through what you're going through. But we had a man in our church who, who suffered a loss. Him and his wife uh, suffered a loss. And God allowed them to put some some lessons they've learned and some things that the Lord has taught them along the way in this little booklet. I just want to give this to you and maybe it'll, it will help you when, whenever you get the time to read it. It's just 77 pages. It's very simple. Uh, as you will find out here in just a few moments, it, it has to be very simple because I'm very simple. Um, but anyway, those are at the back. I am not retiring on the proceeds from this $5, okay? Um, but I've got these in the back. I can uh, take credit card or cash or whatever. If you want to avail yourself of those, please do. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to help somebody along the way. Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. Can we do that? Romans chapter 8. I want to encourage you to, uh, as your pastor has already, to be here as much as you can this week. 
Um, I am absolutely convinced that in 2023, we need more church, not less church. Um, I believe that. I believe God's people need revival now more than ever. And so I hope that you'll avail yourself of the opportunity to be exposed to the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Every opportunity you have, of course, you're here today, but Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, before we get into our text, I want you to do something for me this morning. You don't have to write this down. I just want you to do it in your mind. I want you to pick a date. It, it can be any day, any reason, as long as it's after February the 5th, 1980. I'm going to that away in your mind. It can be any reason. February the 5th, 1980. All right? You have your day? If she were here, a woman by the name of Jill Price could tell you what day of the week your day was. She could tell you what she did on that day. She could tell you any major event that would have taken place on that day. She could even tell you what the weather was like, where he was on that day. Now, for many of us here this morning, our problem is remembering, right? But for Jill Price, it's for she has a domestic syndrome that has resulted in automatic auto every day of her life. Now to us, that, that kind of memory seems like a gift, right? And it would be if we were trying to remember names and birthdays and passwords, <laughs> those dreaded passwords. But there's a downside, a, a dark side, if you will, to a memory like that. In her memoir, The Woman Who Can't Forget, Jill Price writes this, Imagine being able to remember every fight you've ever had with a friend. Every time someone let you down. All the stupid mistakes you've ever made. The meanest, most harmful things you've ever said to people. And those they've said to you. Then imagine not being able to push them out of your mind no matter how hard you try. She goes on to say, as I grew up and more and more memories were stored in my brain, more and more of them flashed through my mind in an endless barrage and I became a prisoner to my memory. Think about that. A prisoner to my memory. I may very well be speaking to someone here this morning identify with that statement. Because you find a prisoner And it could be that you have been living in that prison for many, many years. Even though you've confessed your sin, 
you still feel condemned. Up, You keep sabotaging your own life. You keep believing the self-defeating lies that come from the enemy and become self-fulfilling prophecies. If you find it hard to live in the present because you feel trapped by your past, I want you to know God's got good for you this morning. And it's found right here in the very first verse of Romans chapter 8. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I pray that God helps you embrace this truth today by faith. There is no, I'm talking none, nada, zilpo, zilch, not a whiff, not a hint of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The phrase, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, is a description of those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, let's understand this. That's not to say that we were never under condemnation. We were. So let, let's, let's talk about this first this morning. The reality of condemnation in the past. Now that's not where I want to dwell, but we need to, we need to start there. We need to get an understanding uh, of our condemnation, reality of our condemnation in the past. You see, before we came to know Christ as our Savior, we were most certainly condemned. Jesus says as much in John chapter 3, in verse 18, where he says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned. That's where we are today. But he, he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So here's what we, we learned from that. During those days... Prior to our salvation, prior to our believing in Christ, we were living under the just condemnation of sin. As a matter of fact, the first seven chapters is all about that very thing. Here's what we learn in in. in in just a, a brief summary of, of the first seven chapters of the book of Romans, is that by virtue of Adam's sin, we were all condemned. We're told that, that we have all sinned, and that we have all come short of the glory of God, and that there is none righteous, no, not one wages of our sin or what we rightly deserve because of our sin is death or eternal separation from God. Before we came to Christ, I'll just put it like this, <laughs> of we had no hope Outside of a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I lived the first 16 years. But then something happened. One day. 
And I hope this is your story this morning. One day, we heard the gospel. Amen. Amen. And we were made to realize the mess we were in. I told the fellas yesterday that uh, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Both of my parents were alcoholics. Uh, the only time God was mentioned was when they were cussing at each other and yelling and screaming at each other. And uh, I, There was no Bible in our home. There was no Jesus. There was, there was nothing. I was... This whole church and, 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 and Jesus thing was foreign to me. And so I found myself doing everything I could to escape that environment. And so I would, I would go to church with, with different friends and, uh, in our little town and, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I wasn't saved. And then I went to Baptist Church. And I heard the gospel for the first time ever in my life. And I was made to realize through the preaching of scripture, something that I already knew my life was a mess. But it was worse than that. I was condemned. And I had no hope of heaven. And if I died in that in that spiritual condition, then I would be eternally separated from God in a real place called hell that made the hell that I lived in at home nothing, nothing compared to the hell of the Bible. And I remember Sitting there and, and, and listening to that. But I remember the day that I got saved. I remember the time when, when I fully grasped the truth that indeed I was a condemned sinner. Desperately in need of a Savior. And I, I believed in my heart and I confessed with my, with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I called upon him to save me. And guess what? He did. He did. That day changed everything for me in terms of my standing before God. And if you're here this morning and you're saved, the moment you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it changed everything for you in terms of before God. That day that we got saved, listen church, we stepped in to the reality of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. September 8, 1976, there is therefore now no condemnation. None. No condemnation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 is us if we're saved. We are in Christ. And there is, right now, listen, right now, this moment at 11.24 in the morning, no condemnation. Which brings us to this thought this morning. And it is the certainty, no condemnation. But Prater, it... If there's no condemnation, then why do I still feel condemned? In a word, Satan. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. Condemnation is his native tongue. 
Listen, Satan loves to remind us over and over again of everything we've done wrong. Why? So that all of our emotional energy is spent on past guilt. If we're spending all of our energy on the past, then we're never gaining any ground in the present. Growing. We're never maturing. We're never learning. We're never progressing on in our, in our Christian faith because all of our effort and all of our energy and all of our focus is on the past. But listen, there's no need to feel guilty about past sins. Please understand that this morning. If those sins have been confessed, they have been forgiven. According to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Where the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He, that's God, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, listen, we've already been acquitted of those wrongdoings and we cannot be tried twice for the same sin there is no double jeopardy oh listen the force of the no in no condemnation cannot be overstated it is an absolute negation of our guilt once confessed, our sins are forgiven, forgotten, forever. They've been nailed to the cross. And the hammer of God's grace has no claw. Now, if anyone regrets if anyone had regrets about their life before Christ, it was Paul, the author of the book of Romans. If you know anything about his life, you know that before he came to faith in Christ, he was known as Paul. As Saul... He, he, he was the equivalent, and this is no exaggeration, he was the equivalent to our modern day terrorist. He hated Christians. He hated Jesus. And he made it his daily goal. I mean, his life was all about the arrest imprisonment, and even sometimes the murder of as many believers as he possibly could. Read about it, the book of Acts. It's all right there. I'm telling you, only eternity will tell how many families were torn apart because this invasion into their homes, arresting mom or arresting dad or arresting mom and dad, all because of their professed faith in Jesus Christ. That's what this guy did every single day. That was his job. As a matter of fact, he was on his way to do it again. 
when he met Jesus. And that day changed his life forever. That day on the road to Damascus was the turning point in Paul's life. He eventually became one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever known. God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Now think with me for a moment. How often do you think he wrestled with his past? Okay, so he gets saved and, 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 and Barnabas takes him into the church at Jerusalem. I mean, just imagine as he walks in and, and all of these people begin to cower in fear. That's Saul! That's Saul! What are you doing? And the lady over here begins screaming, It's him! It's him! He took my husband. He killed my husband. And all over the building, people began to point their fingers. And here's Saul. And in his heart, he knows, I'm a new man. I'm a different man. But here he is confronted with his past. Now listen, I told you, I grew up in a town like this. I had no supervision. I had no boundaries. I had no rules. I had no accountability. I was a little hoodlum. And I got in a lot of trouble. And I did a lot of things that I'm not very proud of. And it's, all, it's known all throughout my little community, even to this day. When I got saved, even at that point, I told the guys yesterday, I didn't live for the Lord like I should have. And I have regrets from my life after, even after getting saved. Fast forward now to 1981. I've gone to Bible college. I've come home. I'm on the staff now, Fellowship Baptist Church. I can't go anywhere in liberal because if you live in Tyrone, liberal is where you go to shop and it's where you go to eat. It's where you go to work. It's where you go to the doctor. Listen, I can't go anywhere. And here I was. I, I, I'd go out to eat and there was my past. I'd go to Walmart, and there was my past. I'd go to Big Art, there was my past. I couldn't go anywhere. And you know what the devil began to do? The, the devil began to convince me, Bill, you'll never be effective here. You, you can never have a ministry here. You've got too much baggage. You've got too many skeletons. You've got too much in your past. And you know, preacher, for the first couple of years of my ministry, I believed that. I said, I, I, we're, we're going to have to find somewhere else to go. We just cannot. Honey, I'm sorry. We just cannot be effective here. And I wrestled. As no doubt Paul wrestled with his past. But Paul not only wrestled with his past sin, he also wrestled with his present sin. 
at the close of, of chapter 7, he, he, and some of you may be familiar with it, that, that passage there where he says, the things that I don't want to do are the things I do, and the things that I, that I do are the things I don't want to do. And, and, and he just goes through this, this, uh, this, this word salad of explaining all of this. And you know, that's why, that's why Paul didn't write in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the words, there is now no failure in Christ Jesus. That's why we don't read in the, in the first verse of Romans chapter 8, there is no struggle in Christ Jesus. That's why we don't read there is no wrongdoing in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't say that we would never mess up. He never said that we would never get off track. He didn't say that we would never speak a hateful word again or act selfishly again or lust again or get angry again. Why? Because from his own experience, he knew better. Paul didn't say that there is therefore now no conviction to them which are in Christ Jesus. He said there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And there's a big difference between those two words. Condemnation <clears throat> is feeling guilty over confessed sin. There's no need to feel guilty over confessed sin. Conviction is feeling guilty for unconfessed sin. Conviction is healthy and it holds and it comes from the Spirit of God. Conviction is the way that we get and others in our lives. Sometimes they think that you should never feel guilty when you go to church. And honestly, I'm not sure where they got that idea. Because they didn't get it from this book. Maybe they got it from Joel Olsen. I don't know where they got it. But it's just not in the Bible. The Bible speaks often, listen, speaks often of the Holy Spirit. And you need to tune in But you need to learn to tune out the devil's condemning voice. What Paul knew was true. I left my allergy pills at home. I will get some this afternoon. I just discovered that last night. What Paul knew was true was what I shared with you a moment ago from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul knew that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's how it works. We sin and we do every day. We say something or do something or think something that is contrary to the word of God. And the Holy Spirit convicts us. The book of Acts, again, refer, refers to it <clears throat> as a pricking. So, so imagine someone sitting beside you in, in church and the preacher's preaching and he touches on something that that you're guilty of and that person pokes you with that pin. 
Now, guys, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's your wife, right? Don't go there. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. But somebody talks about anger and they poke you with a pen. Preacher mentions selfishness, pokes you with his pen, and you go, ow, ow, ow. Who is that in real life? That's the Spirit of God. And listen, church, we ought to be thankful for that in our life. Because that is a sure sign that we belong to God. That we are one of His children. Now listen, I don't know how it is here, but Fellowship Baptist Church and Liberal... We don't just walk up to someone else's kid and give them a swat. Because they're not ours, right? right. But if they're ours, then we may very well do that. And the point is, if we're, if we're not God's child, then the Holy Spirit's not going to deal with us about those things. So what I'm saying is, if God convicts us of sin, that's a good thing, because God's saying, you're mine, and I love you, and I want you to live right. And so that's why Paul didn't say, there's no conviction to them which are in Christ Jesus, because most certainly there is. And that's, that's God speaking to us. But if you're still wrestling with guilt and shame and, and you're, you're still bound by guilt and shame because of sins that you've already confessed to God and God has already forgiven you, has forgiven, and, and you're hearing this voice, I want to tell you something this morning. That's not the voice of Jesus. That's the voice of the evil one saying you're worthless and you're helpless and you'll never amount to anything. Can never, you can never get past that and you can never get over that and you'll never win the victory over that. Listen, when you and I confess our sin, that sin is cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Hallelujah. But you know what the devil wants us to do? He wants us to try and fish it out. He keeps reminding us of what God has already forgotten. Years ago, there's an old Southern Gospel song called, What Sins Are You Talking About? And that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus does. What are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. I've forgotten. The devil keeps condemning us for what we have already confessed and what God has already cleansed. And when he does that, then here's what you and I need to do verbally, out loud, if we have to. We need this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's me. So take a hike. Because I'm in Christ Jesus. I want to I want to show you a, a quick video. Um, it's a video of our son-in-law Kelby, who until just recently, June of, of 2021, played professional baseball. Most of most of his career was spent with the San Francisco Giants. Um, he spent all or or parts of uh, four years on on the big league club. And I, I want you to watch this video, and then and then I'll tell you why I'm I'm showing this video. Go ahead, preacher. And now the career of Tony Thompson is about to start. Base hit. High fly ball to left. Trevor back. Ground could be a pair. Donaldson's going to make the play at first. How about that? Today and tomorrow, and this one's in high 
Now, to watch those highlights, you would, you would think that Kelby never struck out or that he never made an error. But that's not true. In his career in the major leagues, he struck out 139 times and he made 18 errors. Three of those in one game against the Rockies, we were there. In Denver, just routine ground balls. And the Gomer booted them. I call him a Gomer because I can. <laughs> I mean, they're just routine ground balls. Like, dude, you're a professional baseball player. You ought to be putting your glove down, cover it. But no. Three errors in one game. So his career as a professional baseball player was not perfect by any means and by the same token neither has our life as a Christian been perfect amen we've all dropped the ball we've all struck out we've all made errors we all have made errors ourselves but here's what God does he does what the creator of that, that short little video did. He edits out of the video of our life all of the spiritual errors and strikeouts that we have confessed and that he has forgiven. And the only time we remember those things is when our great critic, listen, the only time that Kelby remembers making three errors in one game is when me or my son <laughs> bring it up. Huh? We're the devil in his life. Kevin, my oldest grandson, is playing baseball and man, he'll, he'll boot one and so after the game, he'll say, you're looking like your uncle. So we remind him of that. And you know what? That's what the devil does. The devil loves to remind us of our errors. God doesn't remember them. God looks at the video of our life and says, looks good to me. But the devil, are you with me this morning? The devil loves to bring those things up. He loves, loves it when you and I replay those things in our mind. And once again, we find ourselves overcome with guilt and shame and a sense of worthlessness. If you're one who constantly struggles with the past, I want to try and encourage you real quick, and I'll be done with three simple statements. Number one, your past sins were all paid for on the cross. Do not beat yourself up for sins that Jesus has literally already taken the beating for. It's time to let it go. Let it go. Number two, your past does not define 
You are not your past. You are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that you are not what you did. You Listen to me. You are God's masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2. You are God's masterpiece. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And you are not what someone did to you. You are loved. And you are accepted in the beloved. And number three, your best days are ahead. Every sunrise is a reminder that our God is always creating new beginnings and new opportunities. Don't miss them by looking back. The Bible doesn't say that his mercies are new every week or every month or every year. What does it say? His mercies are new every morning. Every single morning. There is a new supply of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. I mean, think about this. Living with your focus on the past will be like driving to work in the morning, looking in your rearview mirror. It's going to be a wreck. Don't live your life that way. Live your life looking ahead. God's new mercy, new grace, new forgiveness, new power, new strength. God makes everything new. It's the devil who wants you to live in the past. But would you do this this morning? Let the past be the past. Because I'm telling you, you lost your past. I lost my past. When we found God's presence. If you believe the word of God this morning, say amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and, and our eyes closed.